that we have been able to gather person to person. So let's give ourselves an applause for being able to do that. There are more individuals that have yet to register, <clears throat> excuse me, and that are coming, but we certainly do want to thank each and every person who is here, both the members of UBE, our supporters, and those interested individuals who have registered for this conference to come and hear about <laughs> roots, reparations, and renewal. You are going to have an opportunity to delve deeply into the history of black Episcopalians in this Episcopal church, beginning with St. James, excuse me, the historic St. James Episcopal <laughs> church from here in Baltimore, amen. And as we meet today and conduct the business of celebration for the union, that will take place at our 2.30 hour. We will have an opportunity then to celebrate some of the, much of the activity that's been going on over the past three years, and particularly those new chapters that have formed and new people that have come on and to be part of the UBE mission, ministry, and work. So get ready for what I believe is going to be a very exciting time together. We have reconnected, and now, we're going to do roots, reparations, and renewal. Thank you all for being here. May God add a blessing to this event. Cover us with his grace and his mercy. Continue to prosper us as people of faith and use us for the upbuilding of God's blessed community. Thank you one and all. I now turn the program over to Herschel Wade who is our intern in the headquarters office of UBE, one of three, you'll meet all three of them over this, this uh, three week period, uh, who is one of our interns, and uh, he will lead us through the program this morning. Thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon. All right, so um, I'm a seminarian at um, Virginia Theological Seminary, um, and I've had the distinct pleasure of working with UBE and planning this wonderful occasion. But first, we're gonna start with a short greeting from our mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott. Hey everyone, this is Mayor Brandon Scott. I want to first wish you all a happy 4th of July and personally welcome all members of the Union of Black Episcopalians to the 54th Annual Business Meeting and Conference. It's an honor for us to host you all here in downtown Baltimore. We are so happy to have you here for a while since you will also be participating in the Episcopal Church's 80th General Convention. There is so much to celebrate and participate in. I will not take any more of your time. I just wanted to welcome you all to the great city of Baltimore and wish you a safe and productive convenience. Amen. Amen. Next, we will be celebrating our roots um, with a spotlight on the historic St. James Episcopal Church. Um, it is the third oldest um, black Episcopal Church in the United States and the oldest in the south of the Mason-Dixon line. And to give us that spotlight, we have Mrs. Elise Du Mason Esquire, who is a member of the historic St. James Episcopal Church. Good afternoon and welcome to Baltimore. Good afternoon. I bring you greetings from the rector vestry and members of historic St. James Episcopal Church, which is located in Lafayette Square in Baltimore City. St. James, I happen to be a lifer born into the church, but St. James has an amazing living and dynamic history. And it began with its founding in 1824 by a very young 31-year-old William Levington. Levington was born in New York City, a free black, and as a young man moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he came to the attention of a priest 
a white priest in Philadelphia whose name was Alonzo Potter. And Potter took a specific interest in Levington, I guess seeing his potential as a young man, and therefore he was responsible for uh, shepherding his early education and supporting his college education at an institution called Union College in Albany, New York, where Potter was on the faculty. I guess it was with his association with Potter that Levington became interested in becoming an Episcopal priest. So Potter also helped to prepare Levington uh, and mentor him as a candidate for holy orders. Levington was ordained to the diaconate in 1823, and he had a vision. His vision was to open a church and church school and school for free and bonded blacks. And his vision included that this would occur in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, at the young age of 31, Levington had no job, no money, and no resources. But yet he was convinced that this was what he should do. So, with Potter's assistance, housing was arranged for Levington in Baltimore. And Levington was uh, resided in Baltimore for approximately six months. Uh, and his, both his board and his room were paid for. He did not have to provide his own resources for that. During that period of time, Levington was searching for a place for the school and the uh, uh, church. And he became disillusioned because it was a very difficult pursuit. But finally, after about six months, he located a room that he could rent in downtown Baltimore, which was approximately a block or two from Baltimore's current city hall. And in 1824, uh, Levington held his first service. Uh, that was in June of 1824, and uh, St. James celebrates its anniversary on the date of June 23rd, 1824, which was the date that the first church service and church school were held by Levington. Uh, in, initially, of course, Levington was quite inspired by all that occurred. However, sadly, he suffered pushback during his ministry for having a school which was for both bonded and free blacks. And the vestry, uh, over a period of time, felt that it was inappropriate that bonded blacks should receive the same privileges in the church and in the church school and in the daily school that, that they received. And over a period of time, they actually attempted to have him removed. Wow. So some of this sounds familiar when we think about what goes on today and what went, went on way back in 1824. Of course, that was very demoralizing for Levington, but he managed to survive. <clears throat> However, a short 12 years after the founding of St. James, uh, Levington became seriously ill and passed away. The next rector of St. James was a man named John Nelson McGilton, and his rectorship began in 1841. He was white, but interestingly, his uh, history was also significant in that he was very committed to the education of African Americans. And it probably had a lot to do with his association with St. James and seeing the success of the school uh, that Levington had started. Interestingly, McGilton was also superintendent of public schools in Baltimore City. And he decided that the city should support a public school or public schools for the education of African Americans. And 
He started in two unsanctioned schools, uh, for one for boys and one for girls, in Baltimore City, and um, encountered a lot of pushback from the school board, who subsequently terminated his services for doing that. After his rectorship, a son of St. James became, <clears throat> excuse me, the rector of St. James, and his name was Harrison Webb. His um, tenure was very prominent in terms of St. James, and he, his perspective on the city and on Maryland in 1854 during his rectorship was that he felt that blacks were benefiting far better in Maryland than in other sister states. Uh, that the civic and religious temperament in this area were actually benefiting blacks. After the Civil War, St. James, as I'm sure is true of many uh, churches, of course, went through a serious period of challenge and decline. And in fact, uh, at some point, it almost went out of business, so to speak. But the revival of St. James occurred in the late 1880s under George Freeman Bragg. He came to St. James, and he was both an active person civically as well as in the religious community. And he literally built the congregation, and the church grew tremendously under Bragg. In 1933, the church building that St. James currently occupies was uh, the culmination of the purchase of that building occurred under Bragg, and the congregation literally had a procession from its former location to Lafayette Square, where St. James is currently located. Um, Bragg uh, was extremely civically engaged and the church grew tremendously under his leadership. The rector that followed Bragg was Cedric E. Mills. He too was an outstanding rector as well as an outstanding civic leader in Baltimore and the congregation continued to grow and prosper under his leadership. It was under Father Mills that uh, a corporation was formed to build the St. James Terrace Apartment, which is a 151-unit apartment building which is directly adjacent to the church property and still uh, very much active today and provides senior housing uh, in Baltimore City. Father Mills subsequently left St. James in 1963 to become the first African-American bishop in the United States, and he was the missionary bishop to the Virgin Islands, uh, which included St. John's, St. Croix, Tortola, uh, and St. Thomas. Perhaps the most, one of the most well-known rectors of St. James is the current presiding bishop, and that, of course, is our rock star bishop, Michael Hurd. <laughs> and certainly, he was a much loved and uh, revered uh, rector of St. James. In fact, it was because of Michael Curry that St. James continues to be in Baltimore City. It was while he was rector that we had a very devastating fire in the church. And of course, at that point in time, population was dwindling in the community. Many of the congregation members were moving to the suburbs. And you know, the question was asked, should we remain in Baltimore City? And it was, with, it was due to his vision and his leadership and his witness that the congreg congregation made a commitment to stay in Baltimore City, and that was in 1995, and the church was eventually rebuilt and restored, and of course, as all of you know, we remain in Lafayette Square. St. James' history is a dynamic and living history. 
We've gone through many challenges and we've gone through many prosperous times. But I think from the perspective of the congregation, uh, we are up to the challenge of the future. We remain very committed to a, an urban ministry and we feel that the best is yet to come. That's pretty much our history and thank you. I'd just like to call to your attention a very remarkable book that one of our former parishioners, who's now deceased, uh, wrote on Father Levington. And she did a tremendous amount of research. Her name was Phyllis Chandler. And I recommend that to you for anyone who'd like to know a bit more about especially Levington's history uh, and the development of St. James in that era. Thank you very much. It is my distinct pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Ron Daniels and Reverend Dr. Robert Turner. Um, these are two prominent voices in the conversation um, surrounding reparations in the United States. Um, Dr. Daniels is the current convener of the National African American Reparations Commission, and he's president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, and which is a leading organization within the U.S and global reparations movements. Um, if I gave you a list of um, Dr. Daniel's accomplishments, I'd, have a, I'd be up here longer than he's supposed to speak, so <laughs> I'd, um, I'll stop there. But um, Reverend um, Dr. Robert um, Turner, he's also a member of the commission. Um, he is senior pastor at the Empowerment Temple here in Baltimore. He was pastor of the historic Vernon um, AME Church um, in Greenwood, Black Wall Street, the community of Tulsa. Um, so today, from them, we will hear um, a historical overview of the movement uh, for reparations in the United States. Uh, we will also hear from them tomorrow in our panel and workshop discussions. So without further ado, Dr. Daniels and Reverend Dr. Turner. Honored to be here on Frederick Douglass Day. Yeah. All right? That's where I give it up for Frederick Douglass Day. given your history, there was a certain intentionality about meeting on this occasion. Right? Uh, first and foremost, let me uh, express my appreciation to uh, our intern who is functioning far beyond the level of an intern, brother, <laughs> who is uh, inviting us here, Brother Herschel. And to say that, I'm glad Virginia Theological Seminary is going to be represented because they are playing, we think, one of the most important roles around the issue of reparations. We've watched their work and they're doing it the right way. And there is, everybody's doing a lot of stuff about reparations, there's a correct way of doing it. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, as well. Uh, the second thing I want to do is quickly, don't have time to really do it the way I'd like to, but to say something about this, the, the question of roots. And to say that I hope that the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church, that the Union will focus more on its roots. Because the history of the black church and its foundational uh, contribution to, what, to create, what, to contributing to what I call the new African community in the US, that role is not sufficiently understood by the broader black community. And I say that because I'm also a retired distinguished lecturer at York College, City University of New York. I spent much of my time as a professor. But also, I just have to tell the story of why I also mean that. I'm out of Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, a lot of the work that we were able to do was because of the Episcopal Church. So I'll come to that in a minute. But I uh, was in Tabernacle Baptist Church. But our second church was actually, it was an AME church, but it was an AME Zion church. For years and years and years, it was not until I was in college and university that I even knew what the AME meant. <laughs> Nobody talked about it. So when we get into the area of black consciousness and black nationalism, we're filling off with our oats and so forth and so on, only to determine that, look, early on, 
Richard Allen and Anselm Jones and others were talking about what? The African Methodist Episcopal Church. So I'm saying that this history is so much, is so incredibly important to us because we need to be made whole as a people. And a part of that being whole is getting over historical amnesia. Coming to know who we are as a people and the role that has been played there is incredibly important. Secondly, I don't have time to really go into this, but I come from, I've, I've done many, many things. That, that little resume is, it's all right. <laughs> Coming out of the coal fields of West Virginia, the summer coal miner, coal miner's daughter, done quite a few things. Would not have been possible, most of it had not it been for the Union of Black Episcopalians. Why? Because in the era of the General Convention Special Program, under Bishop Hines out of Cleveland, Ohio, you pushed the church to allocate millions of dollars, millions of dollars. I'm not even sure you are aware of all of the institutions and the black liberation movement that, that resulted as a result of that contribution. That story needs to be told. We created an organization in Young Side of Hong called Freedom Incorporated. In fact, there's a gentleman here from Lincoln Heights. He and I bumped into each other. We were reminiscing right here and so forth. I mean, I wouldn't have even been hanging out that way had it not been for the Episcopal Church and the Union. Because they funded through Leon Modesti and others. I was in the room. Hundreds of organizations that created the infrastructure for the black liberation movement in this country. Give yourself a round of applause. I also bring greetings from St. Mark AME Church in New York, where the Reverend Kimberly Deathridge is my pastor. Just want to lay that out there as well. But I also bring greetings from the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee. I talked to her. I said, I'm coming. And she's, oh, she, 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 and, and Bishop Curry, I mean, she just like, she, she's, she, she's eager to make that connection. Because you've also played a leading role in this era. And calling about, and calling out, and calling the church out, and talking about the role that the church must play in terms of the repair of the centuries of injuries and damages that have been inflicted. And so the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee, and oh Lord, that woman is so energetic, she's so powerful, she's everywhere. She's a visionary, <laughs> courageous leader. She's the lead sponsor of HR 40, having inherited the torch from the Honorable God Kindness, one of the greatest legislators we've known responsible for the Martin Luther King holiday, among other things. As I stand here today, I have the honor of being the facilitator of the HR 40 strategy group. On Thursday, we will be meeting for the 96th week. 96 weeks we've been meeting to get HR 40, the bill, not just the study, but the study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans is on the brink. But we need a little bit more help. So the Congresswoman just told me, she said, I want you to ask the, the union and Bishop Curry whether or not they would, they would, they would, they would lead the way in, 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 in the next few weeks, if you will. Because we're asking for an executive award. Y'all know the politics of it. We, we, have, we, have, we have 196, 196 co-sponsors. With the yes votes on the floor, we have 207, 216. The Congresswoman is 217, 218 passes the House of Representatives. We are that close to having it passed in the House of Representatives. Wow. This is reparations. An idea 25 years ago, even some of you would have been saying, what, what is the reparations? <laughs> hey, hey, we're there. But we all know that it has no it has no prospect in the Senate of the United States. We don't want a moral victory, we want a real victory. So therefore we're going where? To the president who said he had our back. That's right. And that is Joe Biden for an executive order. But we we but we need to pray. Mm -hmm. And so she's asking whether or not you would help to organize a prayer vigil at the White an ecumenical prayer vigil at the White House, but also showing the tremendous support of the freedom community. So I came to bring that message. Now quickly, let me just say a word about the National African American Reparations Commission because 
the history we'll get into more tomorrow. I mean, it's just, we can't in 20 minutes, and I've already eaten up about 10 of them. This, you know, this is an impossible task. I mean, you know, but, but I've mastered rapid speed, so I'm going to fire it real fast, and then we'll catch up tomorrow. But the National African American Reparations Commission is a body which came to be in 2015. It came to be as a result, really, of this long trajectory of work on reparations. Going all the way back to the very beginning when our people arrived here. But even coming out of the so-called Kazakh free black community, because we were really not free, but people who got, uh, 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 had an opportunity to become free, even in Boston, Massachusetts, there was a woman who came and she said, I need to be paid for my labor. What are you going to pay? And then, of course, you know that the idea of reparations was really not an idea that was really, like, even in this country considered uh, problematic. Forty acres in the mule comes because General Sherman was ready to, in fact, have allocated 40 acres all the way from South Carolina all the way to Florida. Because he understood that how do you, how do you, how do you, create wealth off the back of the people, let alone the brutality of the matter, and then not give them a state. It actually passed, by the way. It passed in the Radical Reconstruction Congress, led by black people, because in the Reconstruction Congress, there were more black people in political office than at any other time than the present. Our folks also don't really understand that either. But it was rejected by President Andrew Johnson. In fact, they turned around and gave reparations to the former slaveholders. The point is that reparations was not an idea that was seen as being a crazy idea. Then you had Callie House, who came forward and organized a whole association with hundreds of thousands of people demanding benefits for the people who had worked and given up their free labor. Reparations is not a new idea. Been there for a while. But it's ebbed and flowed over the years, and of course, as we have suffered and bled and died in this country and had other issues to face, it was not always seen as being something that was most imminent, most probable, or even possible, including with me. I'm someone, some of you may know because you're a conscious folks, someone named Queen Mother Audley Moore. If you don't know Queen Mother Moore, look her up. Queen Mother Moore was the person in this era who, more than anyone else, helped to educate a whole generation. She said she was a brain surgeon. She said her task was to operate on constipated minds, and mine was one of them. I had no idea, never heard of reparations as a master student. Had no idea. See, that's the other thing about reparations is reclaiming our history. How is it that I could be this educated, you know, doing reasonably well, and not even know what reparations were or are? This is the 50th anniversary since the National Black Political Convention. Some of you were there, and some of you would have seen Queen Mother Moore in the lobby, educating all of them folks, all these bright, black, successful people. She's in the lobby. Give us our reparations. We need to get our reparations. She organized, and she worked. Then, of course, she had an impact in the organization in COBRA, the National Coalition for Black Civil Reparations in America, the organization for the last probably 30, 40 years that was the leading organization. It was the organization that, in fact, persuaded Congressman John Conyers that we should do this. And Conyers led the way. And then, of course, he had to eventually passed the torture on to the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee. So there's this long history. Much more than I can say about that in terms of other Tanahashi Coates, others that have contributed to this process in terms of the history. The bottom line is reparations has never been as robust as it is now. And one of the contributing factors was in 2014, the nations of the Caribbean, many of you have Caribbean roots. You come from out of the Caribbean, you know. Many of y'all. You know, y'all come out of the Caribbean. And so those nations, 15 of them, made the decision, irrespective of their politics and the fact that they're still a part of the colonial regime, they are still dependent. They say, we demand, we demand reparations for native genocide, which is incredibly important because that's who we are as a people. They did not ignore the fact that Native people were decimated by the forces of the transatlantic slave, decimated. That was the first principle. We demand reparations for Native genocide and then African enslavement. 
that sent shockwaves throughout the United States of America. We picked up on that and said, oh, wow, look what they're doing in the Caribbean. We need to give a new jolt in the movement here. So therefore, in 2015, we convened a conference in New York, brought people from over 22 nations from all over the world to New York. It was at that point that we introduced the National African American Reparations Commission. That commission has a key charge of number one, having a 10 point reparations program. Because, you know, you, you get out here and, and everybody and anybody, and I don't mean this negatively because it's a good impulse we want to create and say what reparations is and is not. We have to have an authoritative voice. That's who the National African American Reparations Commission is. We have a 10 point program. You can go to our website, ibw21.org, ibw21.org, and you can see it. We have the most extensive online reparations resource center in the world. So you can learn. Event after event after event, all kinds of information you can find on the website. <clears throat> our, our next task is to deal with the issue of HR 40. I've, just, I've talked about that briefly. I'll talk about that more. We have been in the forefront of helping to educate and organize and mobilize people around H.R. 40. <clears throat> and then finally, local reparations. Some of you have heard about Evanston, Illinois, right? Y'all know about Evanston, Illinois? You know, Evanston, Illinois is actually doing reparations as we speak. Robin Ruth Simmons, well, we, we, we certified that. We, we are the ones who came in to work with Robin Ruth Simmons to certify reparations. And indeed, Robin Ruth Simmons is a Commissioner in the National African American Reparations Commission. You know California? California has a California task force. They just issued a 500-page report. Reparations is on the move. 500-page report. Dealing with injuries, talking about what needs to be done. New York is on the way. New Jersey is on the way. Maryland's on the way. But Dr. Cheryl Grills, who's on that commission, dealing with, uh, uh, with um, civic engagement, is a commissioner on the National African American Reparations Commission. We're an authoritative body. We're an authoritative board. Some of y'all know Dr. Julianne Malvo. You've heard of her. I mean, the sassy, you know, the irrepressible. I mean, Dr. Julianne Malvo, or late black America's leading political, political economist. Y'all know her. She's on the commission. You're going to hear from Dr. Robert Turner. You heard his credentials. His church is not only Vernon AME Church. It had the last remaining structure from the destruction of Black Wall Street. The last remaining, one of the last remaining structures. He's on it. And then we have in the audience, Dr. B.P. Franklin. Well, yeah, Dr. B.P. Franklin. Dr. B.P. Franklin, indeed. Yeah. Right there. Dr. B.P. Franklin. <laughs> Who was the former editor and producer of what? The journal African American History on the National African American Reparations Commission. And so as I take my seat and yield to Dr. Turner, let me just suggest that we had that historic conference. We have an incredible powerful relationship with the CARICOM Reparations Commission. We are doing, working around reparations all over the world. Next week, I leave, I leave for Bellagio, Italy. Never heard of it. It's like the Jackson Hole where all the elites, you know, that's what we used to call them, they, they gather and so forth, right? They, they got this, the Rockefeller place got this called, called Bellagio. Never heard of it. Nicole Hannah-Jones, you'll know about her though, don't you? So Professor Sir Hillary Beckles, if you don't know about him, you should know about him, right? We're all gathering, about 25 of us in Italy, to talk about how we improve and build out the reparations movement. That's near Milan, Italy. And then a month later, I leave for Accra, Ghana, where about 90 people will be gathered, including the son of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Dr. Julius Garvey will be there, and many more, to talk about this building out this reparations movement. So, the Union of Black Episcopalians is in the right place at the right time, having made the right contribution and the right decision to talk about roots, reparations, and renewal because we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. We're on our way to get reparations, and when we do that, we have to shout out the names of our ancestors, and among those ancestors have to be Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and all the sisters and brothers and who were who, who are along the path to bring us to where we are. I introduce to you now the Reverend Dr. Robert Turner, because I think we should never ever forget Tulsa. Elaine, Arkansas, talk about that some tomorrow. The Chattahoochee Brick Company and the whole convict lease labor is a part of it well. 
And the fact that reparations is not just for enslavement, it's about all of the other legacies of enslavement right up to the front, to, to the present, including gentrification and, and what we call the Negro Removal Program of the 21st century, urban renewal. When you look at Buffalo, what did they do? The highway went what? Right up through the black community. America must pay for all of that, but we don't say it in a mean-spirited way because we know that when we as black people demonstrated it time and time again, when we as black people develop, we stand for everybody, everybody. So America will benefit when we benefit, and America will not be made whole until we have been made whole. Reverend Dr. Robert Cohen. <laughs> Thank God for Dr. Daniels and coming behind him. The microphone is still hot. Uh, thank God for him. I will be very brief before I begin. I just got a notification that there has been a shooting in Chicago during the 4th of July celebration. The killer is still at large. Can we offer a word? Dear God, we pause in prayer. Remembering yet another senseless killing, mass murder. Lord, we pray for the children who've been shot. We pray for your children all over this country who are still grieving from mass violence. God, we pray for people in power to get some sense and for people with sense to get some power <laughs> and utilize that power that as we today are having fireworks, that you give us the strength to put some fire behind our work and light this nation up for truth. Give her your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I bring you greetings from Empowerment Temple. And as I was introduced, um, a part of my name was left out. Uh, my full name is Robert Richard Allen Turner. And I think that may be a person some of you are familiar with. Uh, my dad named me from birth after the founder of the AME Church and co-founder of the Free African Society with your own Absalom Jones. Powerful and prolific pair they were in Philadelphia during the yellow fever. They sought not to neglect the sick. Yellow fever was akin to today's COVID-19. And instead of running for the hills, they ran to the people and they serve people black and white. I am grateful for the service of them both because without them, I truly would not be here. Without them, there would have been no Vernon for me to pastor. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, the first organization for black people in America, a free African society. Never forget your roots. The f before there was an Urban League, before there was an NAACP, before there was an SCLC, free, and we chose to call ourselves African. Free African society in the midst of an oppressive regime, an oppressive nation. So I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be a member of NARC. I'm thankful to be a commissioner of the Standard Bear for what reparations is and ought to be in America. Um, today is 
the 4th of July. I stand in full support of H.R. 40, uh, House Bill 40, a bill that once implemented would cost maybe $20 million to oversee and to form the commission. And some people balk at that as being too much money. Well, I want you to know something today and check the Government Accountability Office to fact check my numbers. 2019, these United States spent $13 million on one day. This year, they are expected to spend about 15 to $17 million on today for a 17-minute firework show. You can spend 15, you can spend basically $17 million for 17 minutes. That's going up literally in smoke. For 17 minutes. For $17 million. I'm not a math major, but I believe that's a million dollars a minute. But you can't spend 20 million to form a commission to study the worst crime, genocide in American history. And as people ask me all the time, well, what, you know, um, it happened a long time ago. Slavery did. It just it was, why don't y'all get over it? Meanwhile, in my home state of Alabama, the very ones telling me to get over it on the day we, most people, would since celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's holiday, on the same day, they celebrate Robert E. Lee holiday. But they tell me to get over it. And we'll cut you if you talk about the flag passed a law in Alabama and other southern states that makes it punishable by fine to take down a confederate memorial. But they say get over it. But I reply to them, I say, well, if the problem, uh, if, if, if this country's oppression of black people stopped at 1865, I wouldn't be here right now. My dad would have been an investment banker and I would have had some land off the coast of the Carolinas. If our oppression stopped in 1865 and we never had the black codes, we never had Jim Crow, we never had convict leasing, we never had redlining, we never had gentrification, we never had so-called war on drugs, we never had mass incarceration, we never had political destabilization where they came in and killed our leaders. If we never had all of that madness, segregation, if we never, if we never had all that madness, I wouldn't be here today, but the problem is our problems did not end in 1865. And in fact, slavery didn't end in 1865. I'm talking about chattel slavery. I'm going to get to the other ones in a minute. But the Native Americans, I just left Oklahoma a couple of months ago, they kept their slaves, some of the tribes, a year after 1865. The sovereign nation. In fact, a lot of folks don't know that Native Americans own slaves. We cut the trees down on the Trail of Tears. We handed them their handkerchief so they could wipe their tears. Yeah, and they owe us reparations too. We have continued to suffer. Even after slavery, we come into a place as America was spreading west, and we built 
a community for ourselves. And they called her Greenwood. It was so prosperous that the book of Teller Fair Washington from Tuskegee University, then it was called Tuskegee Institute, where I was born, and shout out to Tuskegee, it was founded July 4th, today, 1881. I was born in the oldest and last black hospital in Alabama, John Andrew Hospital. It may sound familiar because from 1932 to 1972, your U.S. government that we pay taxes to administered the Tuskegee syphilis study, watching black men suffer from syphilis, knowing that there was a cure and they never gave it to them. These black men had wives. Ladies, how would you feel if your husband came home with syphilis? Don't answer that out loud. <laughs> and he's saying, baby, I promise you, I'm not with anybody. You the only one. And you like, I think you better call Tyrone. <laughs> Tell him to come and get your stuff. Erica Badu. And the only reason it stopped, I'm gonna finish now. Yeah, I'm getting close to home <laughs> calling Tyrone. <laughs> Uh, we had a church meeting, I'm sorry, I thought at a different place. It's because somebody leaked it to the Washington Post. But these black folk were undenied. They kept building and they eventually created Greenwood, the most prosperous place for black folk in the world, in the country at that time. And the nation, instead of rewarding them, Burned it to the ground. Talk to you some more tomorrow. God bless and God keep you. So we got our keynote speaker. Who's going to keep the mic hot. <laughs> I'm sure. The Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers. She is the canon to the presiding bishop for evangelicism. Evangelism. Should get it right. Right, it's okay. Yeah, reconciliation and creation care. She is also a leading voice in the Episcopal Church for issues surrounding reparations and reconciliation. Um, she's an author of a beautiful book, The Church Cracked Open. If you don't have it, please buy it and read it. Um, and this year, she is also the recipient of the Bishop Barbara Harris Prophetic Witness Service Award. So we are very proud of her. And we're glad to have her speak today. So without further ado, Reverend Cannon Stephanie Spellers. To go from Colin Tyrone. <laughs> and now y'all got me about ready to cry. <laughs> Will you please join me for prayer? If you want to, yeah, we'll, we'll stay seated, but as, as Augustine and my mama both knew, prayer is best sung. <clears throat> there is a poem in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Oh, there is a poem in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Amen. Like most people, I have not been to a family reunion in at least three summers. 
I realized as I was driving down from New York City yesterday that being here with you, this is my family reunion. Wow. Amen. <laughs> And Lord knows we need family right now. My mama, Phyllis Spellers, went to glory in January. And over the last six months, I've made more trips to our home in Kentucky than I had in several years combined, even before the pandemic. I've always loved my people, but now I am more deeply in love with them. Maybe because I have needed them like never before. I feel that way about all of us here. We have needed each other over these last two and a half years of pandemic and reckoning. I mean, Zoom is good, Zoom is amazing. I loved our virtual revival last year. Thank you so much, Rev Kid. <laughs> we had a good time, but there is something, call it a soothing balm that heals the soul something that happens when we come together. Carefully, safely, but together. So thank you, the very Reverend President Kim Coleman <laughs> and the UBE leadership for gathering us in. Thank you for inviting me to speak after my wise and wonderful brother. <laughs> at this particular UBE conference on this particular theme, Roots, Reparations, and Renewal. Now, I love this theme because I know that to make it through times like these, we need to be rooted, rooted in our heritage, rooted in our calling. We need to know who we are and whose we are. We also need repair repair of our broken, wounded bodies and lands, and transformation and repair of systems purpose designed to do us harm. And Lord, yes, we need renewal. <laughs> Not so that we could go back to the way we were, please Lord, help us never that, <laughs> but renewal so that we can become the Episcopal Church that we have never actually been the church that white supremacy would not let us be, the beloved community that God intends us to be. We need renewal to become a new nation, truly the land of the free and the home of the brave, not what Frederick Douglass so aptly described as a land more disgraceful than a nation of savages. You know, he spoke those words on July 4th, 18. 52. And it is not lost on me that we gather precisely 170 years later this day. I know because my hotel room was shaking with the fireworks <laughs> all night long. And this may be Independence Day, but you know and I know that there is so little freedom for too many of us. And there is less now than two weeks ago. Somebody hear me. We were watching in real time. We are still watching as the Supreme Court gleefully, mercilessly strips freedom and protection from women, from the poor, from black voters, and from the earth itself. It's like they rejoice in inflicting pain and installing shackles everywhere they turn. And maybe they do. Heaven help us all. How we need the balm in Gilead. How we need our roots, some reparations, and a lot of renewal. Now as I look at this treacherous landscape and the fresh wounds all around, I'm reminded of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Maybe like me, you see this Jericho road all around. You know the street. In the parable, it is a dangerous road known for its hazards. And so for the umpteenth time, a man has been brutally attacked and left for dead by the side of the road. Two faithful men, a priest and a Levite, 
They see his bloody body. They hear his moaning pleas. They walk on by. The Samaritan does not. Among Jews, the Samaritan was actually an outsider, so he may have known something about the hierarchies that decide that some lives matter and other lives do not. We know he had money, though we don't know how he got it. What we do know is that somehow he has grown in compassion. And so even though he did not beat the man on the side of the road, even though he has the privilege to walk on by, the Samaritan chooses to care and then to act. This man of considerable means and privilege comes alongside the wounded stranger, pours oil and water, bandages his wounds. Then he places the stranger on his donkey, takes him to an inn. Then he stays to ensure that the stranger makes it through the night. And then he leaves funds to secure his care and promises, I will come back. I will make sure that he's all right, and I will pay what is necessary for his healing. In other words, the Samaritan makes a commitment. He commits his money and his own broken heart in order to repair a deeply broken situation that he did not directly cause. Are you starting to see where this is going now? Now that's mercy. That's neighbor love. And that is the reckoning and repair that cannot be dismissed, denied, or delayed any longer for this church and this nation. Because y'all, this land is crisscrossed with Jericho roads. And on these highways and byways, the children of God are regularly, brutally wounded, emotionally and physically, not just by individual attackers, but by systems and structures perfectly and specifically designed for domination and harm. Who will be the Samaritan today? Who are the ones who have gained while others lost? Who are the ones who will choose to place their bodies and resources on the line to ensure repair? What institutions will be infused with the spirit of the Samaritan? What church, what community, what denomination will surrender the privilege of walking on by and instead commit our money, our hearts, not just to our own precious buildings and possessions, but to dismantling structures built by greed, misogyny, and white supremacy? Who's going to build a church that looks like Jesus? This question is especially urgent for Episcopalians, mostly because there may be no Christian community that has benefited more from structural racism. You might even say the system was built by us for us. You know this legacy, these stories. I hardly need to rehearse them for you, but I will. (laughs) And I will because, I, I will speak them because they were silenced for so very long. And I will speak them because some people refuse to hear them now. And I will speak them because speaking itself is a part of the healing and repair we so desperately need. Yeah, we must speak of 1606 the year that English settlers founded Jamestown. Heroes like like John Smith, one of the Virginia company leaders, were actually responsible for unspeakable racial terror, but you don't read about that in his Wikipedia page. The English didn't know what to do in this land, (laughs) y'all. What to grow, what to hunt, what to build. Their settlement was entirely dependent on the Powhatan Confederacy, a group of 30 indigenous tribal communities who had thriving villages and economies long before white people ever set foot on this soil. These industrious and bright indigenous peoples provided for the English newcomers. 
and all they asked in return was peace. Then a drought struck, and the Powhatan could not provide for both their own peoples and the settlers. John Smith, the hero, wouldn't hear of sharing, or God forbid, making his own way. Mm -mm, he threatened to make war. The Powhatan leader, Wahan Sunnikok, begged on behalf of his peoples, and these are the words he spoke. Why should you take by force that from us, which you can have by love? Why should you destroy us, who have provided you with food? What can you get by war? What is the cause of your jealousy? If you will come in a friendly manner, you see us unarmed and willing to supply your wants. We will provide if you come, but just not with swords and guns as to invade an enemy. Smith couldn't hear it. He declared war, annihilated indigenous people, starting with women, elders, and children. And that means the birth of this church, the birth of this land, this nation, was as bloody as anything you can imagine. That's why we as a church, as a nation, owe everything to the displaced and disregarded people who stewarded this land and call the land their relative to this day. Somebody needs to tell it. This is the Jericho Road paved by our nation and our church. This is the reckoning and repair that cannot be dismissed, denied, or delayed any longer. We must speak. We must speak of the Episcopal Church and the Civil War, especially as the General Convention prepares to be underway, I find it illuminating that during the Civil War, the heads of both the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies were not neutral. Both were fervent, articulate, public defenders of slavery. Did you know that? I think a lot of you have probably heard about the right Reverend John Henry Hopkins. He was Bishop of Vermont. Boy, I like to imagine how he's rolling in his grave with Bishop Shannon McVean Brown occupying his seat. <laughs> anyway, Bishop Hopkins, like many Northern Episcopalians, maintained very strong ties to the South. Southern bishops enlisted him to draw up the plans for the University of the South. His sons traveled down and worked in those bishops' offices. And when they needed an airtight, popular, scriptural case for slavery, they turned to him. And the Bishop of Vermont wrote the Bible view of slavery. In it, he claimed, and I'm just quoting, the slavery of the Negro race as maintained in the southern states appears to me fully authorized, both in the Old and the New Testament, which, as the written word of God, afford the only infallible standard of moral rights and obligations. That very slavery, in my humble judgment, has raised the Negro incomparably higher in the scale of humanity and seems, in fact, to be the only instrumentality, slavery, the only instrumentality through which the heathen posterity of Canaan have been raised at all. Well, that was one house of convention. In the other hall, but very much in the same camp, stood the Reverend James Craig. Is there somebody from Louisville who's heard about this man? Thank you. He was rector of Christ Church Cathedral in Louisville, Kentucky, and served as president of the House of Deputies during the Civil War. In 1862, he penned a pamphlet where he spoke of black people as, quote, a race of barbarians, degraded by many thousand years of ignorance and brutishness to the lowest stage of humanity. 
Can you tell they were talking? He then thanked God that, that through slavery, black people have been, quote, placed in intimate contact and under the constant and authoritative superintendence of the most enlightened and civilized race upon the globe. White people. How good and right, he declared that, quote, the cultivated and master race have become the friends, protectors, and instructors of the inferior race. If that's not white supremacy at the heart of our Episcopal life, I don't know what is. And so, of course, the Episcopal Church didn't split during the Civil War. It's because we weren't torn. We weren't torn about slavery, y'all. It was the source of northern and southern wealth and standing. The cash that bankrolled Episcopal-affiliated politicians, churches, institutions, and enterprise throughout this land. Somebody needs to tell it. This is the Jericho Road paved by our nation and our church. This is the reckoning and repair that cannot be dismissed denied or delayed one day more. And so we will speak. We will tell the stories of how when the United States government shipped Japanese people off to internment camps during World War II, the Episcopal Church did not protect her own members. We closed their churches. When public schools were forced to desegregate our private Episcopal schools flourished as a haven for educating white children far from the taint of blackness, leaving Episcopal schools and infrastructure in tatters. I am grateful for all the ways we are speaking and telling the truth about our own Jericho Road experiences in this church. That needs to be spoken to. And we have heard story after story throughout the work on the racial justice audit. Thanks to the work of the Mission Institute, we have surveyed and listened to more than 1,200 Episcopal leaders at every level. And they have told the truth about systemic racism in this church. And I know that many of you took part. You have my gratitude. Because somebody has to tell it. For centuries, we were the church of the slaveholders and, and the governors, the owning class and the managing class. And the privilege we accrued then remains today. Studies show that we are the most educated group of Christians in America and have the highest proportion of wealthy people of any Christian denomination. If any group has gained from the tragic condition of the Jericho Road, we have. Now, General Convention has issued apologies for the atrocities visited on communities of color, including repudiating the doctrine of discovery and the institution of slavery. And we have called congregations in dioceses to investigate, to investigate how they have been complicit in and benefited from such systems. Ah, but the Samaritan. Back to the Samaritan. The Samaritan invites us to take the next step and to commit resource and heart to the ministry of reparations. Now by reparations, I know that there's a technical definition, but by, rep re by reparations, I don't mean simply evaluating the damage wrought by slavery and indigenous land theft and then writing a check to individual people or even to our institutions. There are people who would love to write that check and then say, we're done now. You on your own. Any pain you experience from here on is yours to bear. I'm not willing to let white supremacy off the hook with a check, even a big one. I'm not willing to call that true reparations, and I know you're not either. <laughs> Go to the root of the word, and you will find the word repair. Somebody just say that word. Repair. And what you realize when you say that word is it is a verb, because repair is work. 
Repair is ongoing commitment. Repair, a true ministry of reparations, is deep work with far-reaching results. It is carefully applying the balm, making the wounded whole, healing the sin, sick soul. Repair stretches back to the original genocide that made this nation possible and then connects it to the fact that at the start of this pandemic, while every public health official preached, wash your hands, wash your hands, people in Navajo land had no running water. True reparation seeks 40 acres and a mule, but it also repairs the college educations we never got because of a racist GI Bill. It repairs the homes we never inhabited because of redlining. It repairs the thriving communities and businesses destroyed by urban removal and by white greed and rage. It repairs the wounds and the lives damaged and lost by women of color and back alley abortions. True reparation by the church repairs the vocations lost because of commissions on ministry that perpetuated white male dominance, and not just perpetuated, still perpetuate. This very moment, there is a commission gathering and saying, we just don't see her as a priest. It repairs the churches of color denied admission, denied admission to their own diocesan conventions, many of which are now on the chopping block. True reparation joins partners to discern the investment necessary to heal wounds and dismantle structures specifically built to benefit white people and institutions through the control, attack, and elimination of black, brown, native, Asian bodies, minds, and souls. I would also humbly suggest that true repair by the church, by this church, eventually pays attention to healing the sin-sick soul of the oppressor and the hardened hearts of the oppressive systems. Whiteness and white supremacy is a sickness. It damages something in everyone it touches, including white folk and people of color who cooperate with it. So whatever repair we take on as a church, especially as a church this overwhelmingly white, it has to address the healing and repair of the sin-sick soul of whiteness. Reparations is necessary. Reparations is both pragmatic and eminently sensible, as we have learned from doctors Daniels and Turner this day. I can't wait to study the 10-point plan presented by the National African American Reparations Commission, and thank you for bringing that to light for us. I want to join in. Does anybody else want to join in? I want to be on that prayer vigil. Yes. And I want to join in on the repair and healing that finally addresses what happened 600 years ago, 400 years ago, 150 years ago, 50 years ago, and last week. So thank you, UBE, for crafting and supporting resolutions that contribute to truth-telling, healing justice, and ongoing lasting repair. Thank you for all that you have done to spread healing balm over us as a community so that we can walk together and love one another in all our glorious blackness. I pray that God will provide even more of that balm Enough that this Episcopal Church grows to love blackness like we do. Enough that the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, the Episcopal branch of the body of Christ, gains eyes to see the connection between Episcopal prosperity and the millions of broken, traumatized bodies of color littering both sides of the Jericho Road. I pray that God will root repair and renew us and our church so that we commit like never before 
to make the wounded people, cities, and communities whole so that we commit like never before to heal the sin-sick soul of a church and a nation sick to death with white supremacy, misogyny, greed, and fear. Oh God, give us more of that balm. Oh God, make us that balm. Amen. Can we have a, a, another round of applause for all of our speakers? And can we have a round of applause for UBE? Are y'all ready? Okay, here we go. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we are all baptized by the one spirit into one body and given gifts for a variety of ministries for the common good. Our purpose is to install these persons in the name of God and of the Union of Black Episcopalians to the special ministry and work of being an officer of the Union to which they have been duly elected. Our newly elected officers are the very Reverend Kim L. Coleman, our president, the Reverend Canon Dr. Lynn Collins, first vice president, Mr. James Pierce, second vice president, the Reverend Deacon Linda T. Wilson, secretary, and Mrs. Rose West, treasurer. Leaders, you have been elected as you officers in UBE. Will you, as long as you are engaged in this work, perform it with diligence? We will. We will. Will you faithfully and reverently execute the duties of your office to the honor of God and the benefit of the members of the Union of Black Episcopalians? We will. To our UBE members, who now bear witness to these vows, will you do all in your power to support these persons in their ministry and work for the Union? We will. Let us pray. O eternal God, the foundation of all wisdom and the source of all courage. Enlighten with your grace these newly elected UBE officers, and so rule their minds and guide their counsels that in all things they may seek your glory and promote the mission of the Union of Black Episcopalians and your church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 In the name of God and the Union, I welcome you as officers of the Union of Black Episcopalians and thank you for your service and bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good afternoon again, everyone. Good afternoon. As I've said earlier and now repeat, it is a joy and delight to have each and every one who is present in person, as well as our community of UBE members and supporters that are present online. I just wanted to take a few minutes to offer some words of thanks and encouragement for the work that the union has undertaken, not only during my administration, but in the administration that preceded us over the last 54 years. Some of us are familiar with the words of the Apostle Paul written to that church in Corinth in his first letter. Now I have some former Baptist leanings, so I might be speaking in that old language of King James. Be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding, excelling according to New Revised Standard, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your work is not in vain. 
steadfast, immovable, always abounding. These are apropos terms to describe the way in which this organization's leadership has furthered and sustained the union of black Episcopalians, not only for the 54 years that are current, but anybody who was present and worship yesterday for Father Meadows' sermon got the full history of all those origins that stretch back to Absalom Jones, right? Known as the union for 54 years, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. We gather here today in celebration of those 54 years. I want to talk briefly about some of the work that has been done underneath my prior administration and that's planned for the time to come. But I cannot do that without stopping first to say a union means there's no solo acts going on here. There's not a thing that has been accomplished in the past three years, and dare I say in the past 54 that has been done only by one individual. United, we stand. Divided, we fall. And part of the united leadership that has taken place over the past three years includes our executive committee, many of whom you already saw as Reverend Guy, led us in the installation of officers, and Reverend Guy Lemus served as our first vice president. Our second vice president was Aisha Matupe Johnson, who served faithfully until she had to step down because of family illnesses and obligations. We have our, our secretary, Linda Tardy Wilson, who took over the remaining term for Christina Donovan, who is no longer able to continue as a new college graduate and on the Capitol Hill doing her thing, right? But we as a team came together and said, let's make sure she's able to do her thing successfully and carry on the work of the union. We have as our treasurer, Deacon Clive Sang, who is not able to be here because he is recovering from surgery. And we have also people that are sitting up on this platform as well, including as one of our regional directors, the Reverend Dr. Mauricio Wilson from the Western region. I believe Michael Hughes is out there. There we go, Michael on the front row from the Northeast region. We, <laughs> amen. We also have Carrie Brown, who may not be present at this time uh, because of her commitments to General Convention, but she serves the Mid Atlantic region. Lavani Perry Claibon, who serves the Southeast region. And then also our newest, I've got two more, but also our newest member, who is from the West region, who is Dwight Ward. And now there is one regional director whom I have not named. Wendy Walker. There we go. Wendy Wilson Walker. Amen. Amen. And she is from our, uh, it, it, and she just walked in. Perfect timing. Yes. Yes. She's right here. So those are your regional directors. It's important for you to know their names as well as of the executive committee because they are the ones that help us uh, reach down into our grassroots level. And then, of course, we have members at large, the Reverend Sheldon Hamlin and the, the Reverend Canon Dr. Wilmot Merchant II. Amen? Amen? All right. Thank you very much. Our youth, our young and adult representative, Casey Jones, is not here. And when you read my report in the information that's posted on the website, you'll see his report as well as mine. And they did a stupendous job over the past three years, so we celebrate them. And them including Olivia 
and uh, Andrew Bolton, who were our young uh, representatives, our youth representatives, and Marlene Forrest, who served as, and is, continues to serve as our youth chaplain. And I believe that's the board that has helped carry us forth to this day. Absolutely. And our immediate past president, yes. Canon Annette Buchanan. Yes. So we celebrate. <laughs> We celebrate those individuals because that's the leadership team that has mirrored and continued the efforts of all of the leaders, the sacrifices that have been made, the contributions that have been made to the work of the union. Steadfast, our mission has not changed. Our mission to rid the Episcopal Church of racism and our mission to make sure that there are people of color, especially of the darker hues, that are represented at every level and in every place in the Episcopal Church life, polity, and operation. It has remained consistent and it continues to remain consistent because we are the union of black Episcopalians. Now, I want to just share with you, I'm asking you because I don't want to stand up here and read a report um, that we have already provided for you in your materials. But I do want to take a, a little bit of time to talk about what are the, the formative contextual elements that have driven this board and myself in the actions that we've taken over the past three years and that will be also at work as we continue in our operations. Financial accountability and stability. Some of you have been members of the union for a long, long time. And there are seasons of drought and seasons of plenty. Everybody that is in this room, by the fact that you paid for a ticket or drove a car and registered for this event is committed to the union. Every single one of us. And because of that level of commitment, we know that you will understand as you think about the choices that this board make as to whether or not, rather, as, as to how we could discover ways to keep fluctuations up and down, plenty and drought from occurring to try to get us to a place where we're stable. You may not believe it, but we cannot make it on membership alone right now. The numbers of members we have do not generate enough income for us to be able to support ourselves independently and sufficiently. What's been making the money for this union have been the conferences that we hold, right? And there is never occasion where a conference is play, planned not to be successful. It doesn't happen with committed, loving, devoted members that are here. We don't have control over COVID-19. We didn't have control when somebody in Cincinnati, Ohio decided to shoot an innocent black man. We don't have control when things happen like we have less enrollment than is anticipated for a planned conference. So how do we work to make those conferences even and avoid having ones that lead us into a place of crisis? Because when we go into crisis, knowing that neither from chapter assessments or from membership, we have enough to carry our cost, we end up over the span of our existence to be in a place of having to take out a loan or having to do things to cover our expenses, we don't want to operate that way. At least that's the way this current board and I hope the one coming in thinks. So you found out when you came here because of COVID and because of the way we were doing registration, that man, it looked like we were every jot and tittle well, have you sent us this? Have you sent us that? Have you done this? Have you done that? We want to be able to walk away from here knowing exactly what it costs for us to put on a conference. 
I'm happy to say, even though it may feel as if you spent a lot of money to come, and I know you did, you are, you are living in the benefit of the conference actually costing about $550. Wendy Wilson Walker has the exact, the exact number. It's like 546.47, but I didn't write it down. So that's the actual cost, and if you paid only $350 for early registration, right? The union is absorbing the rest of the cost. It's important for us to understand some of those dynamics. So we're working very hard to get us on a place of stability where we're not depending on just one source of income. That's why inside of the proposed changes, there was the inclusion of the possibility of establishing a legacy fund. And that will not be the only one. We did the online revival, and that was very successful, not only spiritually, but economically. So this board has worked throughout our time to make sure that we're looking at all of our sources of income and cost and making decisions that get us to a place where we are on even keel and going no place but up. So, that has been one of the values that has directed us in our time of being together. The other is uh, operational accountability. We want you to know that we are listening to what the members say, and you'll hear that even more evidently when I get ready to sit down, but listening to what you say as we travel throughout the country and hear your voices, and make sure that the things that you say, the things that you vote on, the things that you decide as a body get reflected in the operations. Even now, when your new members that you just install come on board, they don't get the email to the meeting until they've signed the no conflict of interest document, right? That means that while they serve on this uh, board of directors, that they do that being aware of what the expectations are for their role and what the responsibilities are for their role. So being able to put those things in place help us not only to look um, uh, 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 professional and uh, uh, to be aware of what expectations are and to operate more smoothly, but it also helps us just to know between one another as you can go to the website and read exactly what they're gonna sign, what we're asking of one another. The other element has been transparency. You've seen that in the reports that you get and have gotten in the earlier years. We're trying to give you all the information that you asked for. The resources that come into the union do not belong to me, they do not belong to uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Wilson here, or any of these other officers up here, right? We are the union. Those resources belong to us to use to further the mission. So when you have a question about finances, we're gonna find you an answer. And that's part of what we have dedicated time and attention to for the past three years. We'll go through a season of transition as we say farewell uh, in some ways to Deacon Clive. He's already agreed to facilitate the transition. And we welcome on uh, Rose West as the new treasurer. Um, but pretty seamlessly, you're going to be able to continue to receive accuracy and fullness of information about where we are as an organization. So we have the financial stability, we have the operational accountability, we have the transparency, and we also have something that is very, very important. It's why a lot of you came here. It's the community, it's the connection, and how we're able to value that as we continue forward in our work as an organization. I remember when I first began as a priest in the church that I currently serve and have been in for 20 years. And I was the first woman there and I was the first uh, black uh, leader as rector in the congregation. And it took us a little time to, to kind of mesh together. 
somewhere along the way, you know, I said bye. I, and the Holy Spirit said, no, you don't get to say bye. And uh, <laughs> we sat down and uh, talked about uh, trust. And how, how do you build trust, right? Um, because it was lacking. And they had been wounded, right? And, and hurt people, hurt people. That's just a simple formula. They'd been wounded. So what we, we figured out was when you want to have trust, there are just four or five principles that need to be in place. One is to recognize within each one of us we have filters, right? It's out of our experience, our individual life experience. And that can interpret for you one way that doesn't interpret for someone else. Your husband wants to give you a vacuum cleaner for Christmas. <laughs> and feels it's the perfect gift, you're looking for some bling, right? He does not get it, because he's thinking functionality, and you're thinking glamour, right? Filters. So his expression of love is not, it disconnects. So the first thing we recognize is that everybody has a filter, so we gotta examine ourselves when something hits us and go, pinch, whoa. Is there something about my filter that's making that happen? The second thing is that we committed, this congregation and I, and I hope you be E and I in the leadership, we committed to always verify the source. Right? You will say, I see heads nodding, so people have been in church before, right? We're gonna verify the source and take whatever angst we have in a situation back to the source. Because there's this thing, and I'm not trying to, don't get offended if you have a particular affiliation out there and you think, uh-uh, I'm just showing you a triangle, okay? <laughs> and, 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 that, and we don't want that to happen because it breaks down communication, right? If we start building our practices along those lines as I did in my church and our leadership, it is night and day. There's trust where there was not trust before. What I want to say in closing, and I hope we can all hear this, life is short. We heard Dr. Daniels and Dr. Turner this morning. Life is short, beloved. And there is too much work out there for us to do. We had a close, close election. And that tells me that there are some things in the body that we need to take time to name and have come to the surface and deal with. Life is short. If COVID taught us nothing else, we cannot take tomorrow for granted. And I know that we do not want to stand before the pearly gates and have Jesus ask us, what, you were doing what when I called your name? Right? <laughs> we want to be able to tell them we were building up the union, right? We were up there forgiving people, forgetting, moving on, staying steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I believe if we do that, we will continue to move forward and you will see the union do some amazing work. I think somebody asked us to do an ecumenical prayer vigil on the White House, it's something, something like that. You will see this union do some amazing, incredible things. I love you all. I pray God's blessings and grace upon us as we continue in this new 21st century to recognize we are not outside trying to break our way in. We are sitting at the table of decision making and while we're sitting there, we've got to employ some different strategies 
in order to effectively turn this ship we call the Episcopal Church. To God be the glory. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord and of you be ye, because we will, we will end racism in this church. Amen.